Welcome to James Madison's Montpelier. I'm Ryan Nobles from NBC 12 in Richmond, and we're continuing our conversation on the Bill of Rights. Joined by Police Chief Tim Longo from Charlottesville, who's also an attorney, Hank Chambers, who's a law professor at the University of Richmond, and Peter Irons, who's a widely published author and the political science professor emeritus at UC San Diego. Gentlemen, thank you all for being here. Uh, you, we're Ryan. talking now about the Fourth Amendment. And Hank, I'll start with you. Why did Madison view the Fourth Amendment as a basic fundamental right? Sure. Basic con concept is that a man's home is his castle. It didn't start with Madison. It started well before Madison with the English, the English and, and their view of, of how you ought to allow folks to live their lives. Y you want to be in a situation where, generally, generally speaking, the government can't simply walk up and look through your things, your house, your paper, all those things along those lines. So as a consequence, it made sense to put it in the Constitution at least once we got around to having a Bill of Rights at all. Mm -hmm. And Peter, it's a lot of it's just about basic privacy, correct? That's the purpose of uh, most of the amendments, in fact. Um, but the Fourth Amendment in particular, uh, the privacy is, is the individual's privacy to be, uh, to be free of governmental intrusion that, that isn't necessary for the protection of society. And one of the interesting things about the Fourth Amendment is that uh, when it talks about search and seizure, it says there shall be no unreasonable search and seizure. And that's led to numerous, probably hundreds of cases uh, decided what is reasonable, what is unreasonable, how specific, if the government obtains a warrant, for example, to search your house, your car, your property, your person, uh, how specific does that have to be? And what they were doing in the Fourth Amendment really was responding to the colonial period in which the British uh, used what were called general warrants, and that allowed them to search any place, anything, at any time. People really had no protection. The, the British agents could come in and rummage around for anything. They were usually looking for contraband, smuggled goods, rum, sugar, things like that. And Chief, the Fourth Amendment is something that you've got to deal with probably almost every day in your job, right? More often than any other amendment within the Bill of Rights, we pull the trigger on the Constitution by way of the Fourth Amendment. And the issue of privacy is huge because when we look at just Fourth Amendment applicability, it's really about government intrusion into areas where folks enjoy a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, and as Peter said, the courts have looked at what does that really mean many, many, many times, uh, particularly since it's been incorporated against the states in the, in the early 1960s. 60s. And Hank, is it a certain degree of just uh, the individual's right to even just be left alone, even more of their privacy, but not to be bothered at all? Th that's a good way of looking at it. You want folks to be able to wander around secure in the fact that they can do so. We like to think that our citizens, our free citizens, are in fact free. And it's hard to feel free if you know that at any moment someone can simply walk up, someone from the government in particular, can walk up and just rifle through your things, rifle through your pockets. Imagine you were a woman with a pocketbook. Lots of things in there people don't want to see or you don't want them to see. So that is a, a big part of it. Being left alone, having privacy, having bodily integrity, and knowing that you can can be secure in your in your person. And there, is there a certain degree of it uh, cheap that prevents you then from stereotyping individuals by the way they dress or the way their hair is cut or the way they look? Is that part of that idea of just being allowed to live your life the way you want? Oh, absolutely. Uh, clearly, the, the courts have been very, very clear in that regard that that you be careful not to not not only stereotype but but engage in bias mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to stopping and detaining people the Supreme Court said in a case Wren versus the United States uh, several years ago that it's okay to go ahead and stop uh, uh, a protectual stop of an automobile for example as long as you don't use an impermissibly suggestive bias or criteria mm -hmm. in which to make that decision mm -hmm. Peter would you like to expand on that yeah, and one of the things that's been very difficult, because a lot of evidence is seized by police officers when they're investigating a crime, um, and the courts have to decide whether that search was justified. And so they've developed what's called the, exclu excuse me, the exclusionary rule. And the exclusionary rule means that even if evidence is seized that is relevant to the crime, and in fact might, uh, you know, might uh, show that a defendant was guilty. If it was illegally seized, it has to be, um, it has to be excluded from evidence. And many people think that the, 
that's not a good rule. You know, if they find something, let's say a person is stopped and, and their pockets are searched and there's bags of cocaine in it, for example. Uh, if the police didn't have probable cause to stop that person in the first place, the evidence is excluded. The same thing goes for confessions that are um, obtained without warning people of their rights against self-incrimination. Chief, we see this all the time in television shows, right? I mean, Law and Order, SVU, or in these shows that are kind of portrayed dramatically of where there's a clear piece of evidence that might lead to someone's guilt that's just tossed out. Is it frustrating in your line of work sometimes? Well, the courts have recognized, and I think common sense would tell you that there are some societal costs with excluding evidence from criminal trials, and that cost is the bad guy goes back out into the community. But the court's also been clear to say, this is, this is something we use as a last resort, mm -hmm. not a first impulse. So, you know, when we exclude evidence from trial, you know, it's when the expense of that societal cost is, is not outweighed by the fundamental fairness that's associated with a criminal proceeding. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.